Now, I'm a staunch critic of neoclassical economics. I published a book called Debunking Economics about eight years ago, saying that economic theory is dangerous. And I didn't expect it to be proved so convincingly for me by the financial markets, but they've certainly done it. Now, neoclassical economists completely missed this crisis coming. And my favorite statement of this comes from the OECD in its June 2007 report. Now, for the benefit of those listening to a podcast, I'll read this out. This is the editorial of the June 2007 issue of the OECD Economic Outlook. The current economic situation is in many ways better than we've experienced in years. Our central forecasts remain indeed quite benign. Wouldn't you like to have a cancer that uh, a doctor had been diagnosed as benign? A soft landing in the United States, a strong and sustained recovery in Europe, Solid trajectory in Japan, buoyant activity in China and India, well, the trains have certainly been operating a lot over there recently, going back to the countryside. And in line with recent trends, sustained growth in OECD economies would be underpinned by strong job, strong job creation and falling unemployment. Now, that's not atypical. There was a recent survey by a, a, a Netherlands economist uh, called uh, Bezema, looking, trying to find any economist who predicted this around the world. He found 12. I, I was one of them. The rest of them, and according to Jamie Galthrow's calculation, there's 10 to 15,000 academic economists in America, missed it completely. So they're in the same tune as the OECD, which is why I don't particularly accept their assurances that everything's okay from now on. Now, why are they so ignorant? Two major reasons. First of all, the type of modelling they do is either what can be called static, where you ignore time, or if you have dynamics, you assume they are converging to some nice, stable situation in the future. And they ignore, almost completely, the role of credit and debt. Now, that's not how you should model the economy. We need a version of economics which is aware of time and aware of credit. And you can find that in the work of Hyman Minsky, who's probably the most important economist of the post-war period, who actually foresaw the possibility for this sort of financial disturbance writing in the 1960s when he developed what he called the financial instability hypothesis. Now, one of the criticisms made of Minsky is that this stuff wasn't mathematically modelled. It's just a case of using the right mathematics, which is, in this case, differential equations. And I've built a model, it's by my, my first, uh, my PhD was building models of this nature, where I can show that Minsky's process, when you add it to a cyclical economy, means an economy that could survive a series of cycles in employment and wages share without debt, can accumulate so much debt that at a certain point, You've taken on so much debt to finance speculative activity that doesn't actually increase your productive capacity at all, that it's good by economy. So on this particular graph, I'm graphing the wages share of output against the employment rate. You have a number of cycles that look like things are OK. And then suddenly you have one where you take on so much debt that it's good night, Josephine, with the first, last person out, please turn off the economy. Now, I don't want to say we're quite that bad, but that's the type of direction in which our economy has moved. And if anybody wants to take a look at that and try some situations with and without debt and with and without uh, uh, unproductive borrowing, then I've embedded that into the presentation, which will be available on the uh, Whitlam Institute website. Now, another part of this is modelling the money creation process. And I'm sure all the students in this room are learning about the money multiplier. That has been empirically falsified about 20 years ago. It's still being taught in economic textbooks because they don't want to talk about anything that contradicts the argument that money is neutral. Money is not neutral. We need a model of economy or how money is created that is actually realistic and shows how credit is, is generated. I've done that again uh, in papers building on work by European economists called the circuit theory economists. And to indicate that, one thing you can do with modelling like this is ask, well, if you've got a crisis and it's just caused by a credit crunch, which is the terminology we've been using to describe this crisis, and you want to give a government boost to it, who should you give the money to? Should you give it to the banks or should you give it to the debtors? So in this particular model, I build an economy which is going along nice and smoothly. The bottom line is probably the most important line, the one to see the green one where the unemployment rate exists. And then year 25, suddenly there's a credit crisis. Ah, pardon me, I have the wrong, change one of my settings here. Turn off my stimulus to the firm and start this again. So give me a second here, pardon me. Ah. 
a slight problem. I'm using the viewer here and I can't actually change, this, change the dem demonstration. But again, on, been embedded on the website, you'll find a way of looking at this model and it shows that if you wanted to get a genuine stimulus to boost an economy that where it was just a credit crunch causing the problem, you should give the money to the debtors, not to the banks. If you can just show the, take a look at the simulation there, the red line is a credit crunch with no government policy. The blue line is a credit crunch where uh, one year into the crunch, the government injects $100 million into the economy, or $100 billion, whatever you measure your scale of your economy in. And the green line is we get the same, they give the same amount of money to the debtors. It's pretty obvious which one works better. Now, that type of dynamic modelling is what economists should be doing but instead they don't because they can't even contemplate how money is created with a neoclassical model. And there the theories and their remedies are all going to be fallacious. So my prognosis is nowhere near as optimistic as John's. In fact, I probably win the, uh, the Dr. Doom award around the planet these days. I notice Nero Rabini is, is expecting the recession to end in about six months time. I think it's got a lot longer to go than that. What we are going through is a deleveraging crisis. We haven't experienced one of those since 1930. And the last time it took 10 years in a world war to get rid of it. And this time we're starting up with 1.7 times the level of debt in America, not even mentioning the derivative uh, catastrophe that's also there. And deleveraging, which is the attempt by the private sector to reduce its debt levels, can overwhelm the government stimulus, given the level of debt we've got to now. Back in the 1930s it would have worked, because the debt levels by the private sector were that much lower. Now, to give you an idea in terms of the Rudd government stimulus, the first stimulus that went through was $42 billion, roughly 4% of GDP. I think since that particular stimulus was sent out, you probably could imagine about that much has been injected into the economy already. Our aggregate private debt is just under $2 trillion. Now, if the private sector decides to delever by a mere 5%, that means that in balancing the $42 billion that Rudd's injected in through government spending and government debt, the private sector takes out $100 billion. The mathematics is fairly easy. So I don't think also we can solve a crisis like this by adding on more debt. The whole problem is caused by irresponsible lending, and the only way out of this ultimately is to eliminate that debt by fiat, to simply declare the writ has to be written off. Now, that's part happening in a piecemeal fashion in the, some of the policies under the TARP scheme in America right now. So some of the banks that are accessing the TARP funds have to agree to reduce the debt of their most distressed customers by 30% to access those funds. But that's piecemeal, it takes a long time and it's only slightly faster than letting them go bankrupt in the first place and then you get back whatever you can sell the derelict house for. You need to do it deliberately at a national level and that may well involve bank nationalisation. It's certainly the American banks and the situation they're in now should simply have been nationalised. They didn't deserve to be rescued. And then you hand the assets over to the debtors. Incidentally, there's a lovely little illustration of that in a, in a fund in, in California which took advantage of this nonsense called collateralised debt obligations to buy a whole bunch of lousy mortgages for $29 million. To then bundle those, so $29 billion, I think it was, like you get lost in the numbers billions and trillions these days. Let's say $29 billion worth of mortgages. They then sold $130 billion worth of collateralised debt obligations against those mortgages. It probably was millions, but the numbers are correct. So $29 million to buy them, they sold $130 million worth of the bets, effectively, that these mortgages were going to fail. So they spent $30 million so far. They then, of, of the remaining $100 million, they then gave $29 million to the debtors, said, here's your house, got it back, making a $70 million profit out of the speculators who gambled the mortgages would go under. That's the insanity of the world we've got into. Right now, the... Uh, the merchant banks are on the other side of that trade and now suing that particular company, and I certainly hope they lose. What we have to do is redefine financial assets to stop this happening in future. Things as small as the Tobin tax won't work. And the reason is the credit system, when you look at it properly, is going to pump out as much debt as, you, as it can possibly flog until it causes a crisis. And deregulating was simply a recipe to allow them to do that more comprehensively and more rapidly. We need to redefine assets so people aren't willing to take on that much debt in the first place. And I have two ideas that I'd like to bring in. They sound strange, but I think they should work. One is time-limited shares. Make shares have the same nature that bonds currently have where they expire after 25 years. They're sold for a dollar, they trade up and down, they return dividends, you can vote because you own the share, but in 25 years' time, the company buys it back for a dollar. 
and that should get rid of the ridiculous spikes we've seen in share prices where companies like Yahoo, for example, went from $1 to $120 in a matter of a year and then fell back down to the $3 or $4 mark. And in housing, I'd like to value basis, base house valuations on imputed rent. So rather than being able to value a house of what you can flog it to the next greater fool for, and therefore the greater fool borrows a large amount of money and leverage drives up drives at house prices, I'd rather say the maximum amount that a bank or lender can secure against a house is, say, 10 times the annual rental. And therefore, if you wanted to pay more than 10 times the annual rental to buy a house, you'd need to use your own money. If we don't do something like that, I'm afraid we'll be back here again in 2060 or 2070. Thank you.